Um, we've got a few viewers chilling in from different uh, locations as well, um, across all different states, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide, and even Perth. Pretty exciting. Just give it another few more seconds. We'll get things moving. All right, guys, let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Janaiko Hardwick, Growth Specialist here at Red Pandas, and today I'll be a moderator. Now, for some of our new viewers tuning in, we are a full-service lead generation focused agency and diamond partner of HubSpot. I'd like to firstly introduce Tasha, our Head of Operations and HubSpot, who will be handling our Q&A section, so feel free to drop them into the chat pane. We'll answer to these during our Q&A time. Just a quick note, a recorded version of this webinar will be sent out to those who are registered after the session concludes. Now, I know there's a diverse group of viewers today. Some of you are currently using paid media advertising for your businesses. Some have previously used it. A lot of you are quite new and are exploring the benefits of leveraging paid media. Whether you're new or a seasoned veteran, you'll definitely get a lot out of today's presentation. I now have the pleasure of introducing our two presenters. Firstly, our paid media specialist, Tony Cow, who has, a, who has had over 10 years experience in multiple competitive industries managing paid media. And secondly, our head strategist and CEO, Moby Sadiq, as well as leading our team here at Red Pandas, Moby is an international speaker on the international, uh, on the international marketing circuit. Now, without further ado, welcome, Moby. Thank you, Janaiko. I appreciate that. Uh, hello to Tony. I'll, I'll have the hey. pleasure of introducing uh, Tony's got some great stuff to show us. And obviously, Tash is the behind the scenes. Guys, thank you for everyone who tuned in. I know Zoom fatigue is a real thing. So the fact that you're here, we appreciate it. We promise we're going to make this worth your while and you're going to get a lot of value out of today. So just to kind of get straight into it, before we kind of get into some actual tactical stuff from Tony, you guys can see my screen. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Okay, so what's happening now right so obviously a lot of us a lot of you guys tuning in are from sydney some of you guys are from outside of sydney you know the economy is opening up uh the interesting that we think that we noticed during covid is that covid actually increased digital adoption exponentially from over the top television to over the top media to online bookings to social media some of the stats you're going to see it it has just gone up exponentially and the funny thing is that our media budgets during uh, COVID, one thing we noticed a lot, actually went down, even though the studies tell us, and this goes all the way back to the Great Depression, that when there is a, re a depression or a recession, it's actually usually a good time to increase media spend. Obviously, that's not always easy because there are budgetary constraints, but uh, funnily enough, we are noticing that trend sort of reverse right now. Now, Google released some really, really good data last year when COVID first hit, talking about the rise of the at-home consumer, talking about, you know, consumer habits. And they kind of, you know, had the crystal ball. They could see it as it was happening before it was sort of happening. Now, a year into COVID, the stats are just absolutely phenomenal when you think about the stay-at-home consumer. So one thing that I want to share with you guys is over-the-top media has hit critical mass level. So what is over-the-top media? Over-the-top media is any TV and film content over the internet. And traditionally, this has been uh, younger audiences, um, you know, baby boomers, millennials under, under and, and lower. But we have just seen this everywhere. Now, this might not surprise you too much. You know, percentage of video viewers watching at least once a week, 81% in Australia, that might not surprise you. But what might surprise you is that Australia actually has the most established over-the-top advertising market in APAC, with 80% of video viewers watching regularly. So, over the top media, stay at home media, that's increased a lot. But in our region, because again, today we're talking about paid media, right? It, it, the most established market there is. And Australians watch over the top media more than TV. And this is interesting, right? TV's dead. We know that Netflix has, has killed it. But even more than video sharing platforms like watching YouTube natively. So people watching media on uh, over the top media on their TV exceeds TV and video sharing platforms as well. So video on Instagram, video on Facebook, that type of thing. And just to kind of demonstrate this, um, you see here over the top uh, media here, 73% on that far right, this beats TV. So I don't know if you guys saw this coming, but this, you know, we knew that digital media was getting there, but we've officially exceeded TV now. So a lot less people watch TV than they do over the top media. Uh, and even more than video sharing platforms. So this was a surprise to me. Now, again, why do we care? This is a paid media webinar. Well, when you think about what they actually do and what apps that they use, 
we can try to leverage that. So the most popular, this was a, a study done by TCL. TCL obviously makes televisions, the most popular TV apps um, in the world. Now I did sort of, this is the data for the world, but the top two or three are the same everywhere. So same in every country, almost every country, same across any demographic age group, De definitely in Western countries, whether you're male, female, young, old, whatever, Netflix and YouTube reign supreme. They're always one and two. And the one that's most interesting for me on this, because you know, I know maybe some of you guys are from bigger companies, but most of you guys tuning in are from small businesses, medium businesses. You know, you don't necessarily, uh, and there are services, and we can talk about this towards the in our Q and A time. There are services when you can, we can actually advertise on those very expensive digital media platforms. But for most of us, YouTube is the most accessible one. That's the one that is reigning supreme after Netflix. That's the one that is uh, very addressable. It's very easy to target. And Tony's going to talk about some really, really good techniques, not only actual uh, techniques that you can do, but even creative that you guys should be leveraging now as far as uh, leveraging this whole trend of people at home watching TV uh, or, or watching internet TV as opposed to TV. Um, so the idea of running TV ads versus YouTube ads it's a no-brainer now. It's absolutely a no-brainer. You're going to reach far more people across any demographic running YouTube ads, targeting them on TV than you would TV ads. And that is mind-blowing to think about. Now, the as I sort of mentioned, the pandemic has shifted behavior everywhere, you know, from consuming TV and digital content to, e to even like booking online, like booking your um, medical uh, things online. So this one's really interesting. I know we might have a couple of you know medical um, industry people tuning in today. This is really important for you guys. But even if you're not, what you need to understand is the fact that GPs were forcing older people to learn how to use Zoom and jump on and book their consults in telehealth online uh, has really made that adoption curve for technology rise exponentially. But the most interesting thing is that the feedback that we've seen and the research that we've seen, because we do work in medical in, in industry as well, that old people actually like it. They were actually hesitant at first, but they, they actually like it. They actually enjoy the convenience as well. So that was the most surprising thing for me about this. The other thing, the other trend I want to talk about here is the fragmentation. Because one of the conversations that I have a lot, that our account managers have a lot, that Tony has a lot, is people talk about which medium, which media, like which one should I sort of focus on? Now, of course, there's always going to be those that are going to be better for you. But one thing that we found this year is the fragmentation. So what I mean by that is the brand research crops up in many different locations and many different networks. So for example, this graph here is showing that the percentage of consumers who use each site but then another site or another network to do the same thing. So for example, here you see, you know, people are using TikTok, 58% of them also use Facebook to research a brand as well. Uh, you know, 51% of people who do it on Instagram will also do it on Facebook. So there's good and bad news here. The bad news is guys, you need to kind of be across multiple things. That doesn't mean you need to be across every single network I have here, but you need to be across multiple networks. It's not good enough just to be on Facebook or Instagram or even just running your ads on Facebook or Instagram. You have to have that multiple channel approach. And that's where really good data comes in to sort of figure out what's your 80-20. What are those two, three ones that you got to focus on and the others you don't you know, need to sort of worry about. So the trends on social media, we've seen, you know, in terms of just the exponential usage as well, it grew by 33%. Now, if I'm honest with you guys, this data was sort of the start of this year. I would wager it's higher than that now. Just the, the sheer amount of users on social media. We know TikTok just hit a billion downloads recently, uh, and that is its own sort of beast right now. Uh, but the usage and the time on these networks has just skyrocketed. 83% people percent, 83% uh, of people in Australia now over 13 now use social media. So you can almost target anyone. And like I said before, it's a lot more proliferated. There's a lot more networks that you know we need to be aware of than, than we used to. So essentially in summary, this part here, I sort of just want to say the what COVID has done is it has moved the late majority into early majority as far as technological adoption uh, goes. For us as marketers, this is a great opportunity. It means 
you know, if you, if there's a demographic and that's why we, I'm not going to talk too much about personas today. Tony may touch on it maybe, but the point is defining your personas, defining your ideal customer profile and who they are is paramount because once you know that you can target almost anyone on any media, it makes our job, it makes your job a little bit easier as far as digital media goes. Uh, the other thing too is, even though I sort of mentioned earlier that spend decreased during COVID, we are now well and truly beyond that. If you look at the data, I think uh, we, we might have reported this a few weeks ago on our Instagram. So if you're not following us on Instagram, uh, look at us up, Red Pandas, a lot of stats, a lot of how-tos, uh, definitely follow us there. But we spoke there around the fact that um, COVID, the spend levels on paid media have now exceeded pre-COVID levels and we've already hit record levels. So actually, just in addition to this, what I, I'm pretty sure this was reported not too long ago, but the amount of money that has been spent this year in Australia on paid media, and we still have a couple of months left in this year, has already exceeded last year. So your peers are back, the market's back with a vengeance. So if you weren't doing it during, weren't doing it during COVID, uh, you need to do that now to you know, capture that sort of mind share. The last trend I'll talk about before I kind of pass it on to Tony is privacy. Now, this is something that is really concerning. Um, if you guys read the webinar page we, we spoke about, and we're, we're going to speak today about Facebook and Google and what they're doing, but it's a very real concern. You know, 86% of us are concerned about it. And funnily enough, like I've seen, I've actually sat down next to marketers where they've got that, you know, pop-up that's uh, said, oh, do you want to be tracked? And they'll say, no, I don't want to be tracked because we don't, who wants to be tracked? But as marketers, we're annoyed that we can't do it to others. You know what I mean? So it's kind of this funny conundrum. We want our own privacy. So I'm, I think, you know, most of you will agree with this, but we still have to work with that challenge of respecting other people's privacy as well. So we're going to talk about that today. But that really is sort of a set, my segue to the future of social ads is really kind of talking about privacy. Now, the one that when I talk about privacy and ads, the, the thing that, you know, people think about is Apple's transparency tracking. Um, if you're an Apple user, you've already seen this now by now. So you, before what used to happen is by default, you were being tracked and you had to go out of your way into your app settings and say, I don't want Facebook to track me. Now, since iOS 14, and I think we're up to 15 now, you've started getting these messages. If you're on an Apple device that says Facebook would like permission to track you. Now, of course, no one's going to say not. I don't want to be tracked. Uh, I've actually said yes for Instagram because I just wanted to see remarketing ads. But even me, I've asked not to be tracked as well. Now, this has, had, has set some real conundrums for, for us in the advertising space. Uh, the good news is there are solutions. And essentially what I want to do now is, I guess, pass it on to you, Tony, to actually talk yeah. about what that actually means. Like how, Tony, talk to us about how iOS has, is causing havoc for marketers and what's the actual problem before we, I guess, walk into the solutions? Yeah, absolutely, Moby. Thanks for that. It's it's so true that like even as marketers, we don't want to get tracked. Like we like I saw this coming, and a lot of marketers saw this coming. Two thousand nineteen, like where we didn't want to get tracked, but we want to track everyone. So that's the funny thing. It's quite ironical. But like, um, how many of you um, guys or anyone in the call uh, does social media marketing, Facebook? Instagram, you know, maybe we can leave in the chat and, you know, like leave some of your answers, I mean, your questions and then, you know, we'll answer it at the end, but yeah, Shuna, social media, yeah. Shuna, social Linda. media has, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, we all do. That's good. Shuna. <laughs> <laughs> it's so I guess, powerful. I guess, isn't it? I guess that's media. why they, I guess that's why they're here. Right. Tony? But yeah, all good. Yeah. <laughs> But how, how many of you guys have been affected by IRS with your performance, your marketing campaigns, your lead gen, your e-commerce? Like most of us, the whole industry has been affected because of the IRS update. Apple decided to change things and give privacy to you know, the um, viewers. So what's happened lately and what we've seen for the past year is there's just been um, a restriction of tracking. Originally, let's say for Facebook, right? It was so easy. All you had to do was load an ad and then, you know, you just let Facebook do its thing and then, you know, you get conversions. It was so easy from 2015 to 2019, 20. But things start changing, right? As marketers, we start losing our limited um, tracking functions. We start uh, not able to track, you know, genders, age, all these details that we needed to optimize our campaigns. And then 
the most important thing that I thought as a marketer was retargeting. Like we could, like I used to be able to get retargeting, you know, RRS, um, return on ad spend, like five, 10, 15. Now we can't track that stuff. It's so difficult. And like, you know, Facebook, even like I spoke to a Facebook rep and they're like, it's going to get more difficult next year. We're going to lose more control. We're going to lose more trackability. So Facebook doesn't have an answer. So it's going to get tougher. And like what we've noticed as well is e-commerce has been affected significantly in the industry. Like, you know, Shopify stores, the WooCommerce, they've all been affected, right? And I've seen it, you know, just from personal experience and, and in the um, groups that we're in. But also as Red Panda, what we've seen is lead gen has, hasn't been affected too much. Like um, it's still doing well with some of the stuff that we're doing and the strategies that we're using and implementing. So like we got e-commerce that is like an issue, but like a lot of the legion stuff that we do hasn't been affected. So there's a reason for that. And yeah, we'll, we'll show you uh, maybe, maybe next. Cool. Yep. Okay, so when we're doing Facebook campaigns, I'm just going to use Facebook today. I know there's um, you know, TikTok and Pinterest and Snapchat and those, all these other social media platforms, but Facebook's you know, like, the, like one of the most dominant um, traffic sources available. Um, with Facebook ads objective, the four uh, factors that have been affected heavily the most is traffic objective, the app installs and conversion objectives and the catalog sales. Those four factors are usually what we try to target, like originally, you know, with Facebook ads, right? So, like, let me just move this. Sorry, guys. Um, so those four factors are what we've always used, you know, for um, marketing campaigns. Traffic, you know, more for consideration, more for, you know, like, just to get the engagement. And, like, but we usually use conversions a lot for a lot of our campaigns. And if you look at the typical Facebook users, right, there's actually four different types of um, Facebook users. And this is like very basic, you know, it's a lot more like, you know, complex with the algorithms. But usually on Facebook, you have like a buyer, you got like leads, you have people that don't do anything like me, I don't do anything. I go on Facebook, I just talk to my friends, I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't engage anything. And you have the engages. So if you look at the Facebook users, the buyers and the leads are the conversion objectives that's been affected, right? If we haven't adapted. If your campaigns haven't adapted to, you know, the IRS update, 100%, I guarantee you that your campaigns are underperforming right now. You might get a, you know, 1.0 IRS, you know, ROAS or like an ROI, but that's not good enough in a long-term perspective, you know, for your marketing campaigns. Like, um, it's just, you're not going to last like in the industry, you know, so, um, what else? Uh, maybe, maybe next. So yeah. at Red Pandas, right? Uh, we, we look at um, a framework that we use at Red Pandas. So when we advertise on the funnel, I know there's ads, funnels, and like, you know, conversion. It's usually like a three process. But with a marketing campaign, there's two things like to look at, ads and funnels. So it's either your ads are working or your funnel is not working. Your ads could be, you know, your creatives, your performance, or it could be your funnel. Your funnel could be your landing page. It could be you know, your headlines, your copy. It could be the product. So there's only two things to look at. And that's what we look at at Red Panda, where we're trying to um, analyze the marketing funnel. Um, and if we break it down to like four steps, evaluate the data, change your creatives, restructure the campaigns, and then we evaluate the data again. So, um, maybe Next. Um, one thing I like about this one, before you go on, Tony, is because in preparation for this webinar, we we're talking about, okay, what do we usually do? What do we usually do when we're evaluating a campaign and a campaign's been running? What do we do? And this framework here that, that we're going to take people through is pretty much what we do. And, you know, for the first step mm. essentially is evaluating data. And uh, I'll let you to talk about the, the benchmark stats or some of the benchmark stat stats that you like looking at. Yeah. So as a paid media specialist, numbers are so important to me and metrics. Like it's the only thing I look at uh, most of the time when I have to look at um, an ad account. So like I said, it was ads or funnels. The first thing I look at is usually I go and look at the ads 
and I look at our benchmarks, is our cost per click $1? Is our click-through rate 1% to 3%? Is the frequency 1% to 2%? And is the CPM low or high? So the cost per click at $1 is what we try to achieve because we're trying to perform and we're trying to like um, compete in the market. Facebook is in live auction. So we're trying to get clicks for $1. Anything that's over that is going to affect your you know, ROI or your, you know, your profits or whatever um, you know, you're uh, measuring. Your click-through rate has to be 1% to 3% because if your, if your ads are below 1% to 3%, you have an ad design problem, a creative problem, a message problem. So they're good benchmarks to look at. Also with frequency, frequency um, has to do with how many times a viewer has you know, seen your ad. And it's very important to look at that and keep it low, one to two, because anything over two, usually you start getting penalized by Facebook. Um, you know, I've seen it, I've seen it, seen thousands of ads. And usually when the frequency goes up high, there, there's like a penalty somewhere. Facebook doesn't want to, um, you know, show those ads to other people. They want you to change ads. So it's, it's very important to look at frequency. A lot of um, marketers ignore that um, little detail, but yeah, it's, it's good to have a look at. Um, the fourth one is CPMs. What's the low high PM? What's the, um, so what's a low CPM? What's the high CPM? A low CPM will be around $20 and a high CPM is $88. And you know, you're asking, oh, what, what's CPM got to do with anything? Usually CPM is another um, indicator that Facebook might be penalizing your ads or it might be rewarding your ads. If you have low CPM, Facebook is gonna reward you with better traffic, cheaper traffic costs and higher quality traffic. If you have a high CPM of above $50, $80, Facebook is basically telling you, hey, there's an issue with your ad here or there's an issue with your messaging or there's an issue with how you're structuring your ads. And like overall, those four factors, I mean, there's a lot more that we look at at Red Panda, but just for today, those four metrics are very important when we're doing paid media for Google, for Facebook, for Instagram, for Pinterest, for any form of traffic. Those metrics are usually very important to look at. It's just, it's just that the, the numbers might be different, right? Obviously on Facebook, yeah. it's going to be yeah. a dollar. And that's what we start with. Like often we can get it, you know, 50 cents, 60 cents, but yeah. that's where we sort of start. So yeah, you're right. So we do look at all those metrics, but depending on the, the channel, the number's going to be different, you know, like on Google. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, with Google, like, you know, like I'll just give it to you. We try to keep it one to 2% um, minimum, minimum, you know, we're, we're trying to achieve three to 5%, you know? So yeah, it just depends on it. But yeah. Okay. So we talked about ads and ads could be a problem. So how do we make our ads better? Well, we can't just, you know, like, a lot of people, a lot of marketers just randomly um, create their ads, get a, you know, an image up. We don't do that. We structure it and we become very strategic about it. So there's five structures of a, uh, a successful creative that I've tested. I've tested thousands of ads. And five of these factors are so important for Facebook ad creative. What you have is you have the hook, you have the solution, you have the benefits, you have the call to action, you have a strong pattern interrupt. And, you know, like at the bottom, there is a call to action button. But just in terms of the, um, the message, we want to hook the viewer. I, a person on Facebook or anyone on the internet is embodied with like, you know, 5,000 ads a day. Like, there's just so many ads. And, you know, we're trying to get their attention. So one good method is, number one, a strong pattern interrupt. When people are scrolling, we want to have a strong scroll stopper to stop people from scrolling and they can have a look. We want something to stand out. There are so many ads on a news feed and there's so many organic posts, right? That we need to stand out. And what we've tested is specifically for um, this image. This had a strong pattern interrupt. We had over like a four to five percent uh, click through rate and the views were high because it just stood out for um, you know, people looking at this, the colors, the image, it just, you know, it just pops and gets people to stop scrolling. Then we want to hook them. We want to hook them with a question, something that just engages them psychologically. Hey, listen to us. we got something important for you that you need to read. 
Then we offer them with a solution, something that will help them solve their problems. Remember in marketing, it's not about selling the product, right? It's about selling the problem. So we try to, um, we try to picture the uh, problem and we provide a solution. But on top of that, especially for uh, Facebook, we provide benefits. You know, these are the benefits. This is what you're going to get. And most importantly, we have a call to action. A call to action is so important because there's a lot of people that just read and they don't do anything or they just view. So you need to tell your viewers, click on the button, click on the sign up, click on learn more. You have to tell them. It's so funny because we've split tested so many ads, like thousands of ads with the call to action and without the call to action. And the call to action always beats the non call to action creatives. It's like, it's just amazing how like, you know, psychologically people think and stuff. Um, and that's for just a static creatives. And then when we move on to the next one, Moby, yep, um, videos. Videos are so effective on Facebook, right? We're in a generation of like, um, so in a, an era of uh, videos. Static videos do well if you do it right, but videos can do so much better. Like if you structure your video, it's just like people are just so much more engaged. It can go viral. And at Red Panda, we've been testing so many uh, different videos, testimonials, UGC, user generated content, and you know, like uh, other just engaging branding contents. And what we found is like they they're just so much more effective if you structure them correctly, just like our creatives, where there's a hook, where there's a pattern interrupt, where there's a benefit, a solution, and there's a call to action. When we structure those videos correctly, we see like amazing results. Like for, for example, right, um, Mornington Green is one of our um, um, clients and we tested a testimonial with um, because they wanted to today tonight show and the, the click through rates, the engagements, the watch time was just so much higher compared to like a normal, you know, like um, video that, you know, we would test. And it just shows that testimonials work so, so well on Facebook for, um, you know, e-commerce, for lead gen, because it really engages with the um, cust um, the viewers, and it also shows social proof, right? But also, what you can do is take a little bit further, like with testimonials that work well, but it's even better with like a UGC, user generated content, and with videos on Facebook, no one's expecting cinematic, you know, like Marvel productions, right? But we're not expecting that. What works better is um, user generated content. And what we've tested for e-commerce for lead gen is um, uh, user-generated content versus like a, a well production um, video, you know, like $5,000 spent, $10,000 spent on the production video. And they're just a normal user-generated content from um, the client's customers. And the UGC content always performs, like always performs. From their Better selfie camera. Like from their yeah, iPhone selfie, selfie camera. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause it doesn't so funny, look like an ad, isn't it Tony? It doesn't look like marketing. That's yes, the thing. It's native. Yeah, easy. Um, I'll move on to the next slide. I, th I think the, the, the key point there you made is it's all these factors together. I'm sure you guys are listening, thinking, oh yeah, we do that one and we do that one and we do that one. But what I would ask you to do is, is go back and audit your ads. Are you doing the what's in it for me? Do you have that pattern interrupt? You know, and, and look at all those factors together because it's all those little 2%, 3% that do add up. And because so we looked at ad creatives and we looked at, um, you know, like statics and videos. The next thing, the next factor that we look at is how to restructure the ad account. So there's a lot of people that structure their Facebook campaigns um, not effect, not not wrong, but just not effective or efficient because you want to get your bang for buck, right? So how we structure it, and this is how we test, is a campaign budget optimization campaign and an asset budget optimization campaign, and we let Facebook um, do the you know the learning, do the optimization. So how we structure it is usually. Um, one ad set uh, budget campaign or a campaign budget optimization. And we have three to five creatives per ad set, just so that, you know, Facebook can optimize. Usually what we used to do um, a while back was one ad creative per ad set or, you know, per um, yeah, campaign. And that will do well because, you know, you could find out what would work and what not. But if you're limited on budget and you want to get the best, you know, optimization um, performance, let Facebook optimize for you, create three different creatives, add into an ad set um, you know, campaign or campaign budget optimization campaign, and just let Facebook do its thing. 
You can have three creatives, like three static images. You can have a video, you can have an image. But the whole point is to let Facebook um, optimize. And if you're limited for like budget, there's things that you can do. Like, you know, I know some of us ask, oh, you know, how much should we spend? Like the budget isn't too important right, on Facebook. It's more about like um, the, a good creative, a good message. If you can get that right, Facebook will reward you. And there's you know, things that you can do like dynamic um, your creatives and stuff like that, that Facebook really optimize and you know, get your money's worth. Um, so that, that, yeah, that's how we look at um, for restructuring our, your ad accounts. Um, yeah. Um, uh, one, one thing I'll notice here is just, just not to glean over it fast is guys, you'll notice the amount of creative. So Tony touched on this earlier is almost always people underestimate the sheer amount of creative that they need to test static video, this, that, the other. So yeah. that's something, and I guess that's also, it comes with resourcing and that's why, you know, if people have the budget, uh, either they have the, if they have the time or the budget, they can do it themselves or utilize someone like us, but um, it's important to have that volume as well. I'll move on to the Absolutely. next one for you. Yeah. And also what works that we've been testing lately um, is quiz landers. So it's a quiz funnel. So basically the, um, you know, a viewer will look at the ad, then they'll go to a landing page and it's a quiz. What we found that it's number one, very engaging. The click-through rates are very high and the conversion rates were very high and the uh, CPL uh, cost per leads were high. Um, I didn't invent this. I didn't make this uh, quiz. Um, our superstar account manager, uh, Linda did. So, you know, she's very good at it. So, you know, like, you know, we'll also share some stuff next time. But basically, with quiz landers, is it just engages the viewer to click through, to have a read, and they're more engaged because, you know, not their attention is fully on the quiz. And what we found out was, um, if you look at the results, we had 279 leads and, you know, we had a CPM of $31. Um, $2.44 per lead. Is that $2.44? Yeah, lead? that's $2.44 yeah. per lead. And that's like, not per click, that's per lead. Yeah, that's per lead. So uh, a lot of you know, marketers or people would get, you know, will pay for $10, $20 per cost per results. You know what I mean? We're getting leads at $2.44. Our click through rates are 5.62%. Our CPC cost is at 55 cents. So like quizzes do work, they work very well. If you have the right message, the right ad, you know, you can scale a campaign very high. And we actually did too well, maybe, with this campaign. Um, the client had to tell us to slow down. That's, that's the funny thing. Yeah, fair enough. And I, guys, definitely stay through to the end because there is another tip on top of this because it's one thing to get them into your database. And it's another thing to, you know, I guess, you know, leverage automation to make this work. So we'll talk about that as well. Yep. Also... Another thing that um, I have to look at, especially on Facebook, is the Facebook page quality score and the customer feedback score. So just to clarify, Tony, because sometimes I get some misconceptions from client on this. This is not the yep. quality score of the ad, right? You're talking about no. the quality of the page. So fundamentally, what's the, you know, what are these guys' page quality scores? Yes, that's correct, um, Moby. So yeah, not to get confused, that's, that's a good point. It's not what's on the ad that you see, like the um, average, you know, like the quality score, your average below, above. This is on your Facebook um, page that you have to check, your page quality score. But also, you know, like you need to know, like if you're violating, so you need to know if you're violating any Facebook community standards, you need to know if there's restrictions or violations, because number one, that can perf um, affect your ability to advertise but also that could penalize your ad accounts. You can have high CPMs, you know, higher costs. So it's very important to look at. Secondly, but it's probably a little bit more important is the customer feedback score. Facebook does a survey to the customers who convert on your ads and they survey them and ask them about your business. You know, was it a good experience? You know, did you get your product in time? All these you know, surveys and questions they ask. And if you don't achieve a customer feedback score of over two, you will be penalized. And what that means is you can either one, lose um, your ad account. And you know, we don't want that. Like, you know, I mean, 2020 was a big issue, you know, like people losing their accounts was all over the industry. And, and that, was, um, that was due to customer feedback scores. Secondly, um, you, like your ad costs will skyrocket, you get high CPM. And thirdly, Facebook will not give you the best traffic or the highest quality traffic. Why? 
because Facebook is about user experience. They want to deliver the best experience to the viewers. You know what I mean? Because it's it's a bit of a touchy situation right now for Facebook with privacy and everything. So they're they're trying to deliver a user experience, right? So you like we need to achieve like a customer feedback score of over two. And there's ways that you can do it. if you're below two, we can you know, boost it up and you know, keep it high. But yeah, it's all it's all about like providing great customer service. Um, cool awesome so um the 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 thing that i want to talk about now is and this is very technical but very very important is the facebook conversion api or cappy for short so this whole ios thing right now the issue is that apple doesn't want you to drop a cookie on an iphone's browser on an iphone's user so if you look at the bottom row there that's what traditionally currently happens with the facebook pixel someone visits your website on their their iphone and then it drops a pixel uh, on their device you know browser pixel event and that's how we can remarket and do that now of course facebook's making our jobs difficult now this isn't a silver bullet solution but it is something that solves a lot of the problem and that's what is known as the Facebook conversion API or CAPI. So the key difference here, guys, the way to sort of think about this, the easiest way to think about this is the pixel is browser side. So that's where it drops a pixel on the browser. The, the Facebook conversion API is website side. So that actually drops it on your website. So it kind of bypasses the browser. It's all happening on your, on your website server. Now, the benefits of this are... Next slide here. So benefits are, so conversion APIs can track the same conversions as your Facebook pixel, such as lead, complete registration, add to cart, purchase, you know, lead again, you know, was so important. I'll put it in twice, <laughs> page view. So it can track all those things. Now, the key thing to remember is the same rules do apply for Facebook pixels as they do for Cappy. So that means you can only have eight events. You can't track everything. Now, to be honest with you, like, if, if a client's working with us, they're probably not sophisticated. So they don't have more than eight. They're probably, probably only have two or three. One could be, you know, lead. One could be, you know, page view, convert or whatnot. Um, so it, it doesn't solve everything about iOS 15, but what it does do, it's Facebook's answer to iOS 15. It is a way to get more data, more, I guess, you know, um, guesstimate data, and it, it makes your job a little bit easier. Now to, to set this actually up, um, it's not, uh, there are, with Shopify, there are some plugins. I know there's some sort of plugins. Um, if you know what you're doing, if you have a coder who knows what he's doing, by all means, give them the instruction. This did take us a little while to figure out properly. And this is something we do for our clients. Um, but honestly, if you are advertising in 2021 and beyond, this is something you need to get onto like ASAP to ensure that your data is clean. You're, you're tracking iOS uh, 15, 14, you know, 14 users properly. Um, and it, again, not a silver bullet, but it is one of the things that Facebook is doing. They're working really, really hard on Cappy to make more aggregated conversions, to get more uh, estimated conversions, uh, to get your data a little bit more robust. Now, on to the next thing. Um, the next part that Tony is going to be talking about is Google Ads, right? So the future of Google Ads. So, you know, very, very similar thing to now, this is when we think of cookies. This is the most easiest you know, example that we've always been taught. Um, it's very, very similar to the previous graph you saw. It's the pretty much the exact same thing, right? A visitor goes to your website, you know, Google will drop a cookie. Um, they leave your website and then they get a remarketing ad, right? So that's how Google works. Now, one thing that Tony will talk about is, uh, or if we haven't already mentioned it, Google hasn't been as affected by Facebook, which is really good news. It has not been affected as Facebook because Google has so much more data. So for example, like on YouTube, when you're on YouTube, uh, you're logged in YouTube. Most people log into YouTube and then they jump onto Google as well. They're already logged in. So even if you're using your search on your browser and then Apple doesn't want Google to know that, Google still knows that because you're using their search and then you jump onto their platform and you're then searching there. So their database, their ecosystem is a lot more robust. You use a lot more Google products than you realize. So it hasn't been as effective. Having said that, the days of the cookie is uh, very numbered. Cookies are dying. Uh, funnily enough, you know what you guys may not realize um, is... And it's okay if you haven't, because you're lucky, Google has given third-party cookies a stay of execution. So initially what Google was going to do was phase out cookies 
uh, start of next year. And what that meant was they were going to replace it with something else. But with a lot of lobbying from the group, from media groups, from agencies, from the industry, they've delayed that now by a, a year. So the good news is you don't have to worry too much. Your cookies are still going to work. You're still going to be able to see conversions. You're still going to be able to remarket. That, that's good. But, you know, if I can give you a bad dad joke, what happens when you leave, leave cookies in the oven for too long? They burn, right? So <laughs> you need to get onto this stuff. You need to start looking at this stuff now. Uh, and it's not even about waiting until cookies die or not, because doing some of these things I'm going to recommend to you guys now will mean that your data already today is going to be a lot more robust. It's going to be a lot more accurate. If you're spending, you know, if you're spending a, a couple of hundred dollars and, you know, maybe you aren't, that's okay. It probably doesn't make a difference, but if you're spending thousands of dollars per month, this stuff makes a huge difference, guys. So here on this slide, I quickly want to talk about how you guys can prepare for the death of the cookie and some of the things that Google's already doing that you can leverage today to make your data uh, more robust. So the first one is use uh, Google, the Google uh, Global Site Tag or Google Tag Manager for conversions tracking. There are so many ways, like Google is, you know, Google is like, Excel, right? Excel is great. It's very simple. You can do things this way or that way, but it's also very complicated because it's so, there's so much you can do. So when you want to track a conversion for Google ads or YouTube, you can just drop in the pixel. You can do that, but we don't recommend you do that. We recommend you do the more intermediate or advanced thing, which is using a global site tag or tag manager. Tag manager is just a way to deploy the site tags, a little bit more robust. Some of you guys may have heard about it. Um, it's not the scope of today for me to explain it but it just makes it a lot easier. It integrates with Google's products a lot easier and it's more quote unquote privacy ready. Uh, Google's trying, these guys, I mean, guys, these guys stake their business on ad revenue, right? So they're doing what they can with the tools that they can, some things that we don't even know about um, to take care of this privacy era, to take care of ROI, to take care of tracking. So I would, you know, take their advice. The second one is use enhanced conversions. Um, it's more accurate data. It's better data, better measurement across networks. So for example, if you're running Google ads and YouTube, then if people are jumping across networks, um, what we've already seen data of is there's been an increase, a median increase of conversion rates of about 3.5% for search ads and 12% in YouTube ads just by using enhanced conversions because the data is more robust. Uh, the next one is, now this one isn't, this is purely speculative. Honestly, guys, this is a bit of a guesstimate from us. I'm not saying if you do this, this is going to help, but you should do it anyway. And that is use Google Analytics 4, so GA4. So most of you guys, I would bet, are still using Universal Analytics and nothing is wrong with that. But GA4 is designed to be better for cross-device tracking, uh, geolocation tracking, so you can figure out where people are has a lot more better reports. And like anything, guys, when Microsoft releases, you know, Windows or XP and or whatever they're up to, I'm on Mac, so I don't know what Windows is up to now. But when they release or 10, whatever, they will stop supporting the old one, right? So this is one of those things they're going to sort of stop supporting and putting all their resources on. So I don't know if this will make an impact, but if I was going to make a bet, had a gun to my head, I'd say, yeah, do it. I think it will make an impact. And the final thing is ensure your account is in safe hands. One of the issues that we see uh, is a lot of double tagging. So you can imagine you might've put a conversion pixel and then you use tag manager and then you use enhanced conversions. Someone, it's very, very easy. We see this literally every single day when we audit accounts is people that, uh, the biggest problem we see is double tagging and double uh, conversion. So um, use a reputable agency like us or get someone in-house who knows what they're doing. Um, set it up so you don't go six months down the track and you realize you've been tracking your conversions twice. Um, but yeah, onto that, uh, back over to you, Tony. I know, thanks guys so much for your patience. I hope you guys are still getting a lot of value. I've seen everyone sort of stayed. So thank you so much. Um, we've got a little bit more to show you, but on that note, Tony, I'll let you talk about the YouTube ad formats that you're finding are working really well for our clients. Cool. Thanks for that, Moby. Um, yeah, be before I start with YouTube, like just a bit of YouTube, it's the, you know, one of the biggest um, platforms available, right? Everyone's on YouTube. Why? You're even on YouTube for entertainment, you're trying to learn something, um, you know, like just so much, you know, goes on on YouTube, but it's, it's just one of the biggest platforms around and there's a lot of traffic youtube is very new for people but like it's like a lot of people on facebook or on google search or you know google display but no one's really done youtube as much 
Why are we talking about YouTube? Is because we've been testing a lot on YouTube lately. We've been testing so many different um, platforms and formats. Uh, formats, sorry. So YouTube advertising advertising formats has um, you know, skippable videos, non-skippable bumper ads, overlays. There's so many different ones, and the display ads are coming into YouTube now. I think there's you know responsive that's coming in. But we've been testing a lot on Red Panda lately. We, we just tested so much, like. Um, so we know what's working, we know what's the performance, you know, what's going on, and we've been getting, um, you know, promising results. So, um, yeah, there's just, um, it's, it's just like a, a big monster, basically, YouTube advertising. But yeah, um, next, uh, maybe. So there's, there's different ways of targeting on YouTube, right? You know, like, like I say, there's, there's displays, there's placements, there's keywords, there's topic, customs you know, audiences, there's just so much. And like, where do you start? Because if you don't start correctly, you're gonna blow your budget. Google will eat your budget. If, you, if you're putting, let's say you're spending $5 a day on Google, Google won't spend $5 a day. Google will spend $1,000 a day. If you don't know how to manage it or tame, you know, uh, Google, um, YouTube specifically. So what we've uh, found out is like, um, keyword targeting is one of the um, best promising, um, results right now that we're seeing. So like Google's got the biggest search engine in, you know, in the world, right? Billions of searches, you know, they, you know, like they got data on everything. The second biggest or largest search engine is YouTube. Everyone's all searching on YouTube again, right? So if I go on YouTube and I type in, uh, type in you know, how to fix my, you know, like leaky tap, how to fix my window, or I go and you know, type in, I will find on stuff on how to, you know, and fix things around the house and i'm pretty sure most of us has done that we're trying to figure something out how to change a tire how to change you know like a car engine oil we've gone on youtube so there's so much um data on youtube that you know people don't utilize or leverage so with keyword targeting like we are looking for um let's say you know clients on digital marketing and you want to find digital marketing if i go on youtube and i type in you know digital marketers Google will come out with a suggested, um, you know, keyword um, suggestion. So this is hyper intent targeting. We can find out what people are searching for on YouTube. And if we find out the intent and we, we cause you know, there's uh, different intents for searches. There's, you know, like people that wants to buy, there's people that wants to view, there's window shoppers and you know, keywords um, can illustrate a lot of things. So if we target, let's say digital marketing um, help or digital marketing simplifications, we can present our video on YouTube targeting those viewers. And it's so much more engaging. It's so much more hyper intent and it's so much more um, relevant. So what does that mean? That means your results should be a lot more higher. You know, your click through rate should be higher. Your viewable rates should be higher. You know, it's just so hyper intent. And we've been testing keywords targeting and it works really well. There's a whole process that Red Panda does with keyword targeting, like very intense, and we do it very well, that we strategize on what keywords to use, we find out what keywords are working well, and we leverage and we dial in on those keywords, and we see amazing results. Like, I mean, yeah, I've seen them. So yeah, we, we've got a very good strategy for keyword targeting. And you might be asking, can I do it myself? Yes, you can. You can go and look for all the keywords, but it might take you six hours a day, right? But like at Red Pens, you know, we do it very well and we do it very efficient. Um, if you guys, time. if you guys do have, you know, once if I could say, if you guys do have Google Ads already, uh, it can be a little bit of a proxy for research. So, as you, if you, if anyone's done Google Ads, you guys know this. There's the keyword ads you bid on, and then there's the queries. So the ad you, the keyword you might bid on might be women's hats, but the query you came up for was where can I buy a woman's hat in Flemington, whatever. So. If you yeah. look at one thing I will say is, you know, if you want to, and definitely guys want to leave you with some actionable things you can do is check, do jump into your queries. If it's been a while since you've had a look and look at the queries that are converting, you know, look mm. at those. And uh, the other thing is kind of workshopping. What are people searching for at different stages of the funnel? But that's a really, really good start. And then, you know, deploy some of those on the hyper intent targeting keyword targeting format. But yeah, no, that, that's an awesome tip, Tony. Thanks for that. Next one. Mm. And, oh yeah, so with keyword, yeah, so I can't jump the queue. With keyword targeting, you can add all your keywords there and um, you can find it. But like I say, um, you know, you, you have to go find your keywords. Uh, like um, Moby said, go into query, have a look at it. If you're staying in your campaign, you know, you really have to do your keyword research, you know, red panners, we do it so well. So, you know, 
uh, give us a buzz also. But yeah, next. Hello. Um, Placement sorry. targeting? The next one that works down the pyramid, um, it's like a pyramid. Uh, sorry, yeah, placement targeting. That, that's the next one on the list. Placement targeting works really well. It's relevant intent targeting. So what that means is, let's say I go on YouTube and I type in men's health. Well, with men's health, there's going to be a whole list of videos and that's relevant to the keyword, you know, like I search for. Those videos, hopefully they're monetized because um, um, with YouTube, you can either have a monetized video or a non-monetized video. Some videos don't allow ads, some videos allow ads, but if we can target those videos that are relevant to the keyword research and those words are for, um, allows advertising, we can become really, really relevant with um, you know, what we're trying to promote or uh, market. And it works really well. Like what we've done is we've gone and we've found all these videos you know, that's um, relevant to a topic, like let's say men's health or like um, you know, education, you know, so, and in, we've just placed those um, information on um, those videos where we want to target. And it's just like leveraging off someone's hard work. So what, what, what I mean by that is, let's say on the right, right, the image, uh, online education. Well, when I type in online education, there's going to be a whole list of, um, you know, like videos about online education and stuff. But people have, um, you know, we're getting, what, 5 million views, six, 700,000 views, you know, 15,000 views. We want to leverage off other people's hard work, right? So we want to place our video on those videos because you know we want the artist to do all the hard work to you know drive all the traffic, and we just want to place our video on that target um, section and you know just uh, advertise there. So placement targeting is very very like relevant and it's really like effective if done correctly. Um, maybe yeah i love that it's kind of like the it's okay. like the um you know those fish that attach onto those sharks that do all the work for them and eat their scraps yeah it's kind of like that so yeah placement targeting is, is really decent if you can leverage off videos that your persona is interested in for sure yeah um the the problem with uh youtube placement targets is you can go when you're creating a YouTube ad. You can go onto placements and you can select YouTube channels, YouTube videos. But the problem with those, if you do click on them, those ads are not that relevant, and a lot of the videos and channels are outdated. They're, you know, they're very old. That's the problem, right? So you can spend your money and go for YouTube channels or YouTube videos that's recommended. But I tell you what, they're not going to give you the performance you want. Um, and it's going to blow your budget. It's going to eat up your budget, $100, $200, 1000 It will just eat it up. So what we do is we go and find specific videos, um, you know, placements that's highly relevant to the persona that we're trying to target. So what, what that means is, like I say, on let's say online education, right? We try to find videos that are relevant that still has engaging audiences and we target those um, audiences. And you know, like it works really well. Like it's hyper um, targeted, the performance are there, the RRI is there and, um, you know, the click-through rates, the, the metrics um, just you know, perform. So, um, yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay, I mean, the, the, the key thing there is um, testing, right? Testing works, testing works. Uh, test, test, test. So I think um, that's there's so much you can do on YouTube. You know, Tony spoke about placements and keywords. That's just two. They're, they're the two yeah. that 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 he's really loving right now and really liking right now. Placements. Yeah. So placing it on web, like people searching for uh, certain videos, certain channels, and obviously those keywords. So they're the two things that we're finding that are working quite well. Um, but okay, cool. On that note, that this is the last home stretch, guys. Thank you so much for your patience so far. Now, also, Shilna, you asked a question. I think this is going to help your question as well. Um, uh, you asked a question around. Facebook lead generation, the lead generation lead ad format, um, uh, you know, how effective is it? Uh, and I think you said you haven't seen it that effective for yourself. So uh, this that will be covered here. And, and obviously, feel free to ask any follow-up questions if it does not cover your question. So the third component is marketing automation. Now, of course, we have done webinars on automation like we've spoken for an hour on automation. That's not what I'm designed to do. I'm just going to give you that little snippet overview that overlaps with paid media, right? So 
Um, we're, uh, it's no secret, uh, if you guys follow us or know us, you know, we're a HubSpot Diamond partner. Um, you can do this, a lot of this stuff with other platforms. We're probably just not experts on it. You know, like we know a little bit about active campaign, but you know, we don't pretend to know systems that we don't work on, but we know for a fact, you can do this on HubSpot and, um, you can probably do this on Southern, some other marketing automation suites. One thing that HubSpot does do that. It makes it very easy. Like as marketers, we don't like technical things where, you know, we don't like, um, you know, complicated things. We like, you know, the joke is colors and pictures and really, really easy things to use. So um, they have a really, really nice dashboard, right? So this is a screenshot from one of our clients um, and you can sort of see here, yep, I've got data that I would see in Facebook. There's nothing surprising yet, impressions, clicks. But what I can also see is total contacts. I can see the people who actually became a contact. And that's not just a contact from a form, although it includes those. It also includes if they look, if they clicked on an ad and then, you know, farted around on my website and then came back and then converted on some other random form. But it also has, so it has cost per contact and then it has cost per customer as well. So if they actually end up becoming a customer, now obviously garbage in, garbage out, right guys? But if you're using your, your uh, HubSpot, your automation, your deal stages as you're supposed to, particularly some of our, you know, clients who are, you know, I know Marcus is here. So obviously you guys might use dual stages. Uh, our B2B clients will use, you know, use stages. It probably applies to almost everyone apart from high volume e-commerce. Um, you could get, you know, this data very, very easily. And even with e-commerce, there's other ways to get that data. So it does make your job a little bit easier. And when, when Tony and I were preparing for this webinar, we're like, you know what? It actually hasn't affected a lot of our clients. And the ones that it hadn't affected as much are clients leveraging HubSpot using an automation system as well. And you'll see sort of why. So one of the other reasons um, that HubSpot makes your life a little bit easier, they have automatic source attribution. I know Salesforce Marketing Cloud has this, but I think you have to pay extra for it. So that, that's a little kind of, you know, burn on Salesforce, but I think you can do it in Salesforce. But what automatic source attribution is, it automatically figures out where the person came from. So here it can, without tagging, without anything, right? Without filling out a form. So here, this is a lead source report by original source. And it can see, you know, amount of people came from paid social, direct, uh, organic email marketing paid search. So it's order attribution. Now, sometimes order attribution isn't right. So you can also do, you know, this is a regional source. So you can set up your own lead sources. So one of the things that we had been doing is having more, uh, look, we, to be honest, we did this before as well, but having a specific landing page for a channel. So having a landing page, you know, in the back end, it says dash AdWords, dash Facebook, dash Instagram. Because if we're losing data with iOS 15, iOS 14, if we're losing data where they sort of came from, a proxy for that can be a landing page that we've set up. We know that landing page is only ever used. Now, of course, you, you lose a little bit of the journey. It makes funnels a little bit harder if they arrive on that landing page and then they come back on the home page and then they convert. Maybe we lose some of that, but it's something, right? It's something. It still works for direct response ads where you don't need a funnel. Uh, now, Siona, this is something I want you to pay attention to just based on your question. So lead ads, guys, for those of you who don't know lead ads or don't remember lead ads, lead ads are those ads where you don't need a landing page, right? So my example on the left here, you, um, it, it's, it's, yeah, there you go. So my example on the left, the user sees it, they click on sign up or buy or whatever, and a form pops up in uh, Facebook, right? It doesn't take you to a landing page. And then you, you know, fill that out and then it sends it to the user. So HubSpot, and actually, to be honest, I think Active Campaign does this, Salesforce does this, most of them do it, to be honest. They integrate very nicely with lead ads. Now, the question you sort of asked, I know we're going to do questions at the end, but I think this is worth, it's worth addressing this now for you, Suna, that um, you spoke about, let me go back to your question so I get it right. I feel like the quality of leads are not great at all. None of them convert. So a couple of things that, that would concern me. Um, maybe the targeting is not, let's assume your targeting is correct. With two things on how HubSpot really helps. So on one side, you can see here on the right, and it probably doesn't make sense. It's kind of small, but we've set up a uh, workflow. So the lead ad is, uh, is completed. The data goes into HubSpot. And based on the answers of that person, we can send them some communication. So on the right here, you know, someone fills out a lead ad on any page. Um, we change their lead status, and then we change their property value, and then we send them an autoresponder. We've done things in the past where like if someone has, you know, with that tree example, uh, Mornington Green, because you can buy trees. If you buy a particular tree and you, you, you see a particular tree, we tell Facebook that, hey, Facebook, that person likes this tree, send them information on that tree. 
What that allows us to do is have more personalized email, emails and information that go to that user. So that definitely, definitely helps. The other thing I'll do, I'll say is now, I know this is hard, but this is something we tried with a client of ours, Wimp to Warrior. They complained, I remember it was about a year ago, they complained, guys, our lead ads aren't working. You're just getting a lot of volume and no conversions. Like, okay, one thing you've got to remember with lead ads is the half-life is very short. So what I mean by that is if you don't get to them quickly, and I'm sure this has happened to you, people are like, what are you, where are you calling from again? It's like, but you clicked on my ad. Like, how do you not, like we think, how do you not remember? You clicked on my lead ad. How do you not remember that you, you did this? The thing is, because the friction is so low to do that, their memory is very short too. So the half-life of that is very short. So one thing that we did that worked really, really well, we asked Wimp to Warrior to have an SLA to contact those lead ads within half an hour which meant that the ads only ran from a certain time to a certain time, but we noticed that that significantly increased their lead ads to the point where they're still running them today. So I hope that sort of answers your question. If you have any more, we'll, we'll get to it at the end. But um, that, that's sort of kind of a couple of ways how lead ads works really well. Uh, the last thing I'll sort of talk about is uh, the most under-leveraged feature. I've spoken about this many times this year in our other webinars, but audiences. So what you can actually do is you can target you know, a lot of you guys know what custom audiences are. You can target, you can have a list, you upload it to Facebook and you can target them. But what we can do with HubSpot is you can have an actual contact list. You might have a list of people who are ICPs, their ideal customer profile. They're in a particular state. Um, they have certain traits that you've, you know, you've created a list with all these traits that you like, really, really like. You can natively integrate that with Facebook. So because of the integration, you can natively target that list all the time. Another really, really good, now this works better with volume. Another really good list is anyone who falls into, it's a very basic one, anyone who's a lead, anyone who's ever inquired falls onto a list, that's a dynamic list, and you target that mob with something that's a little bit more later down the funnel. So I'm not sure if Marcus is still listening from Personalized, but for example, Marcus, you might do, so they do obviously optometry and, and laser eye surgery. You guys might send them a process video or how the process is for your business, but just for that list, not to not to anyone else, sorry. Um, but yeah, so I guess that's essentially it, guys. I'll stop my screen share. Uh, I'll see if we have any other questions. Um, but Tash, actually, I might sort of, you know, kick it to you um, to see if anyone else has, yeah, or if course. you saw anything else. Yeah, easy. So I'm um, obviously very conscious of time. So um, if anyone needs to go, you can head off. But there are a few questions that have come through. For those of you that can stay, feel free to stay and hear the uh, specialists talk about them. So we did have, obviously, you've answered Shilna's question, but in, another one that came through um, was in regards to Facebook ads. So the pros and cons between using a Facebook lead ad, as Moby just showed us, which is native in Facebook, versus sending the lead to a landing page where you might be saying the same things again, you know, solution, benefits, CTA. What, what do you guys um, have on that for us? I'll let you take that one, Tony, um, so I spoke about that already. Yep. So for male experiences, they both work well. That's um, if you're using Facebook lead gen or you're using a landing page, um, they both, you know, they both work, but it's just more um, about your messaging, your creators. That's what the, that's what we want to focus on because we have tested lead gen, um, you know, Facebook lead gen campaign. We have tested, you know, like a landing page that's been optimized with great creators and they both work well. So, you know, they both support each um yeah, they both work well. We can't say they don't, but yeah. I think it's a quality awesome. quantity thing as well. Like obviously, obviously lead ads get a lot more quantity because the friction is so low. You don't have to go to a... The other yes. thing too, guys, we didn't we didn't touch on this today just because already thank you so much for your patience. I really appreciate it just because of brevity of time. But landing pa your landing pages have to be fast. They have to be quick. They have to be easy. And half the time, that's the problem. But even if it's a, a second loading time, it's still friction. So you get a lot more qualified people that come through landing pages, but the quantity is not there. That's why we sort of like automation for lead ads. And we like people getting back to their leads quickly with lead ads. Awesome. Thanks, and, guys. Yeah, um, absolutely. Anything else, Tony? Sorry. No, that's it. Cool. Awesome. Uh, there was one other question um, that came through from our viewers, and it was in regards to budgets. Uh, there's always questions around budgets and some of the metrics, Tony, you mentioned earlier, again, on the Facebook ads, like trying to achieve that $1 cost per click and that 1% to 3% click-through rate, uh, can that still be achieved with smaller budgets? So I know, you know, at Red Pandas, we deal with bigger ones, but um, what say you on that? Absolutely. Those uh, those metrics and those, um, you know, key performance indicators, 
that is designed for lower budgets. That's what we try to achieve, you know? So when you have a high budget and you're scaling, like it's still, you know, like profitable or still within the um, KPI, but it always starts with a low budget because you want to achieve the high performance on a low budget because when you scale, performance will drop a little bit. So absolutely for low budgets, that's not a problem. Yeah, awesome. Uh, I think myself and all the viewers can appreciate that paid media is not uh, the easiest context to listen to. And I think Moby and Tony, you guys have done a really good job at kind of breaking it down for us and the viewers. And, um, you know, they can always reach out to us with other questions if any more pop up. But otherwise, uh, that's it for our Q&A. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, oh, thanks, guys. Um, I know it's past 11. Thank you so much for staying to the end. You guys are amazing. You guys are awesome. Um, thank you so much from me and everyone else. And I'll let uh, Janaiko kind of round it out. Yes, thanks, Moby. Thanks, Tosh. Again, again, thank you, Tasha, for looking after our Q&A section. And again, thank you, Tony and Moby, for your presentation. Uh, awesome content, as always. I want to thank everyone for tuning in this morning. Um, hope you all enjoyed our webinar. And I feel this is a great insight, how you can leverage the benefits of paid media advertising within your businesses. Um, now, on behalf of our team here at Red Pandas, I'd like to wish you all the best. Hope everyone continues to keep safe and well during these times. Thanks again, and bye for now. See you, everyone. Thank you.